My mother lives down by the river. You might see her up early walking before the sun rises. And if you pay attention, you'll notice her clothes in black plastic garbage bags crammed under a park bench. Or you might see her sitting huddled with a donated coffee. When a storm rips through, we try to get her up to higher ground, away from the danger of flash floods. But she usually thinks it's a conspiracy. She spent evenings in torrential rain under that very bridge, and she is bundled up to survive 30 below nights. Sometimes in the summer, she sits in the town common, her head nodding as she fights sleep, but usually she likes to stay out of the public eye. My mother has mental illness. We think it's paranoid schizophrenia because she hears voices from the FBI and an underground pornography ring. She believes they have both drugged her and put her under subterfuge surgical procedures at two separate times, and then have proceeded to wire her so that they can communicate with her. And then the two organizations battle back and forth inside her head, tugging at her conscience, advising her every move. I say we think it's paranoid schizophrenia because we're not really sure, as we have yet to successfully have her fully evaluated and diagnosed. Don't get me wrong, we've tried multiple times. But they simply check her blood sugar levels, give her an eyesight test, make sure she's healthy, and then dismiss her, while saying to me only moments later on the phone, your mother needs help. The police, the nurses, the homeless shelter, they've all told me this. Your mother needs help. After she spent a summer stalking my family, recording all of our movements, I approached the police about concerns for my children's well-being. They told me, well, if she kidnaps them, then we can do something. The ambivalence and lack of action taken to help her has often left me completely dry. Sometimes I see her in the grocery store. Her eyes get wide behind her glasses, and her face becomes a mixture of familiarity, nervousness, yearning, and defensiveness. And she simply nods. I often pass her walking through our very small town, her head down as she watches her every step, her brow furrowed into permanent crevices, her mouth pursed into tiny lines of stress. Despite all of this, when I tend to tell stories about my mother's current state, I do it in a joking manner. I mean, there's the time that she did show up at 3.30 in the morning, locked my dogs in the barn, and wandered into the woods, only to return four hours later barefoot in her pajamas, saying to the police, I know this looks crazy. I just wanted to pick some strawberries. There was a tab at the local coffee shop she put in my name. There was the time she hijacked my sister's car. Or there was the time she lost ownership of my childhood home. And it was when it was torn down, she posted a sign in the front yard that said, this house is still here. It is just underneath an invisibility cloak. But you aren't really laughing about those things. And if you are, it's uncomfortable. I see it in your eyes. You think this is tragically heartbreaking. Maybe you are thinking of your own mother and how terrible it would be to see her like this. In fact, when I tell people my mother is homeless and crazy, sometimes I see blame in their eyes. How can I let my own mother live in the cold? How can I let her wander the streets all night long? How can I t let her take free handouts of food? What kind of a daughter would do this? What kind of a daughter am I? Trust me, this is not the first time these questions have run through my head. But guilt cannot dominate the complexity of my mother's situation. She has been kicked out of every charitable organization available in our town. Her mental illness has made her a threatening, aggressive, terrible force. 
We have tried to get her assistance through courts, hospitals, the police, mental health agencies, and shelters. But you and I, we both already know that our society does not do enough for mental health. In fact, I would even attest that it does nothing. And so, a few years ago, after a particularly nasty encounter with my mother, where she had shredded and defiled all of the Christmas gifts my family had given her, leaving them in a snowbank next to my mailbox with a long letter berating me for everything I am, I let the idea of who my mother was die. I let myself become an orphan. Because this woman, she was not my mother. No, my mother had long, dark, lush hair and a quick laugh for any dirty joke. Having had me at 17, she raised me expecting more. My mother loved barbecues and fruity wine coolers. She made the most delicious homemade bread that she would let me cut into before it had cooled down. She attended every one of my school events. My mother reprimanded me if I ever judged anyone based on their appearance or beliefs, and she reminded me through her own daily perseverance that it didn't matter that we were poor or that we were women. We were strong and we were wild, and we would march forward and conquer our own fears and any barriers that others dared to set down in front of us. My mother taught me to be courageous, empathetic, and grateful. She taught me to work hard. My childhood was not a scene of perfect bliss, but my mother made unspeakable sacrifices for her family because she loved us, and she raised us to love and treasure our own children, which I do. And the woman who was my mother, she would not want me to let the woman who is my mother into my home. She would know that my life would be filled with anger and sadness and danger. She would know that my children would suffer interminable scars and live lifetimes of undying grief. My mother would want my days to be filled with dream catching. She would want me to be a good mother. And a good mother is not one who allows strangers to tear down everything we have built because gnawing guilt consumes us. My mother made unspeakable sacrifices for her family. She would expect me to do the same. Thank you.